Alrighty, well, welcome to lecture 4.2 and continuing our exploration of issues around energy. Um, energy and finding sustainable sources of energy is probably um, in the top three or four most pressing sustainability issues that we um, need to solve along with climate change and you know climate change and energy issues are obviously very tightly close uh, tied together and um, water and other top issues like that. Um, we are going to focus on this lecture specifically on oil and gas. The next lecture is going to look at coal and nuclear power. Um, the reason why I've lumped oil and gas together is that um, they are two natural resources. They're both fossil fuel resources and they both have enormous economic importance in today's economy. They provide about 60% of all energy used by um, our global civilization today. They provide fuel for transportation. They're vital for heating and lighting and cooking. And additionally, they also are used in the manufacturing of synthetic fabrics, plastics, fertilizers, detergents, um, as well as many of our other common everyday household products. So in short, it's pretty hard actually to imagine how our society in its current form would be able to function without oil and gas. So today we're going to look at where oil and gas comes from and sort of what the nature of it is. Um, we also are going to focus on key advantages of fossil fuels as an energy source and this applies to this lecture and the next lecture as well. And then we're going to look at sort of the political, social, environmental, and economic impacts of non-renewable energy use. And sort of where we're at in terms of what, how much reserves we have and um, how um, much into the future we can expect to have these sources of energy. So probably just sort of three key terms that you probably um, may not know too much about yet that you want to pay attention to this lecture. One would be this concept of peak oil. Another would be this idea of what's conventional versus unconventional methods of extraction. And then finally, um, fracking. Okay, so Fossil fuels dominate the energy portfolio of the United States between oil, gas, and coal. That's predominantly where we get our energy from. Um, oil and gas consumption in the United States are actually down. Um, we're consuming less from our peak consumption days of oil and gas, but natural gas, or sorry, oil and coal, but natural gas is on the rise. We're using more natural gas now than we ever have before historically. So one of the reasons why we are so dependent on fossil fuels um, and why they've come to dominate our energy portfolio is first of all, they're inexpensive. Um, compared to things like solar power and wind power, um, they are still cheaper. Um, they also have a high energy density. Basically what that means is you get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, you don't need a lot of coal, oil, or gas to get a lot of energy. So they have lots of stored energy in them. Um, and the other thing is that we can store the energy for future use so that we can have energy when we need it. So um, we can overproduce electricity and then store that electricity so that when we um, turn on a light switch or heat our home or cool our home, that energy is available and that power is available when we need it. That's not the case with all forms of energy. So those are the key advantages. Um, the figure that I have on this PowerPoint, you can see um, between oil, gas, and coal, um, we're over, well over 75% of energy um, in the United States, and then you can see the remaining percentages. And these are some of the alternative forms of energy that we'll look at in future classes. But this picture here, I wanted to just, that's what crude oil looks like when it's been extracted from the earth, this dark, thick liquid. 
most oil and gas starts as micro started off as these microscopic plants and animals that lived in the ocean. So these are some highly um, micro um, and you know highly zoomed in um, images of what the plankton and um, other marine plants would have looked like before turning into oil and gas. This of course happened millions and millions of years ago um, and it's why we refer to them as fossil fuels is because they they formed from the fossil remains of these plants. Um, uh, it takes millions of years to turn plankton and fossils into oil and gas and so that's why they're non-renewable. In um, our lifetime and the lifetime of civilization um, we will not be able to generate um, new fuels, fossil fuels, fast enough to keep up with the rate at which we're consuming them. So how do we use oil? Well, um, oil use has been growing strongly over the last century um, here in the United States. Um, it has decreased um, slightly, um, but it's still continuing to grow strongly in other parts of the world. Um, some of the most obvious ways that we use oil um, is for transportation. Um, almost half of all of the oil that comes out of the earth is turned into gas um, or um, jet, you know, another large percentage is turned into jet fuel um, and another large percentage is turned into diesel fuel. So if you take the jet fuel, the diesel fuel and the gasoline, you'll see that um, a good over 50% of or over 75% um, of a gallon of oil is being used for transportation. It's also being used to heat um, homes, to generate electricity. Um, it's used cr frequently in the asphalt that we lay down on the um, on roads to pave our roads. Those are some of the most common forms of it. But it also is um, a byproduct or used to make all sorts of things from plastics to synthetic materials and chemical products. And in most of our common household items, we have petroleum. So everything from clothing to balloons to hand lotions, to tires to shaving cream to contact lenses um, are made out of petroleum. So it really has integrated its way into our lives. And um, if and when we run out of petroleum, um, it will change the way we live our lives. So that gets to the next question, are we actually running out of oil? So right now we actually don't really have a good replacement for oil. Um, what we use oil for and what we use petroleum for, we don't necessarily have a good substitute. Um, we, we do know that many countries around the world today are producing far less oil than they did in the past. Um, and you know, there's just a reality geologically that there's only so much oil on this earth and eventually we will use up the oil that we can access and get um, access to. Um, in the 1960s, the United States was actually the world's biggest oil producer um, and we have drastically decreased the amount of oil that we're producing. Um, the lower 48 states is now producing about half as much oil today as we did in the 1960s and 70s, and Alaska is also at about half production. Um, so here in the United States, between Alaska and Texas is where most of our oil is coming from. Um, so in the United States, despite uh, an increase in demand for oil, there has been a decrease in production. Um, partly just because there's only so much that's available and only so much that we can extract from the ground. Um, so there's this concept that I said to be aware of, and it's this concept of peak oil. And peak oil is the point at which we've extracted the maximum amount of oil in a year. Um, so 
that we and after that we will never extract the same amount of oil it doesn't peak oil does not mean that we've run out of oil it just means that we've reached the point where we um, in an annual basis have extracted the most amount of oil most barrels of oil and then we are starting to go back down the other side of the hill and the next year we will extract less and the year after that we will extract less etc until we have extracted significantly less. So peak oil production in the United States occurred in about 1971. Um, we have not produced more oil in the United States per year than we did in 1971. We've been on a decline ever since. Um, but that's not the case um, for the rest of the world. Globally, we have not reached peak oil production. There's many countries that individually have experienced peak oil, like the United States, um, but globally we have not seen a decline in overall production. We're kind of at the stage right now where we've kind of plateaued, we've kind of flattened. We don't seem to be increasing production, but we're not necessarily decreasing production. So scientists and other experts are not willing to say that we've reached global peak production. Um, so we're not on the, at the top of the hill and going down globally yet. We still have um, significant oil reserves um, in the world. Scientists nowadays, geologists um, and other experts like engineers, are um, very um, either reluctant to or completely disagree with each other on how much we, oil we actually have left um, in the world. We know that um, as technology develops, we are able to um, scan and image the earth like we never have been able to before. And so as a result, we're able to find oil in places that we didn't know oil existed. Um, we also have recent technological advances in the way that we can extract oil. So it means that oil that used to be too hard to get, for example, because it was really deep offshore, or it was trapped in really unconventional sources of rock, we actually now have the technology where we can extract that oil. So we've increased the amount of oil that's available to us um, compared to what was available, what we thought was available in the 70s and 80s and even in the 90s. So that's one of the reasons why um, it's really difficult to predict when we will reach peak oil production because technology keeps advancing and we keep um, finding new ways to get oil out of the ground and we keep finding new oil. Um, there's also political reasons why it can be um, difficult to predict peak oil, um, primarily because um, certain things slow down oil production. Um, for example, in the United States, there's long been a battle between environmentalists and oil um, companies um, over things like offshore drilling or drilling in sensitive ecological places like Alaska. And depending on, um, you know, who's winning at any given moment, the environmentalists or the oil companies, um, production might slow down or speed up. Um, and so when that happens, um, it sort of throws off how much production is occurring. Political uncertainty in parts of the world can also drastically slow down drilling. So when we are in a time in the Middle East, like in Syria right now, Syria has large oil reserves, but of course there is so much political uncertainty in that country that they aren't um, in a place where they can really focus on drilling um, and extracting oil. And so that slows down production as well. So there's a lot of political factors that play into um, oil production. Um, economics also plays a significant role in how much oil we're extracting. For a long time, the price of oil was pretty low. Um, people weren't making a lot of money off of a barrel of oil, and so there was less um, incentive to extract it. Um, it was also um, not very um, feasible like financially to try to extract it in hard to reach places. But now that oil has spiked in price, we've seen a drastic increase in how much oil sells for on a global market. It makes it much more financially feasible to extract oil from places that um, were more expensive. So the picture that's on your slide here is of oil, um, tar oil sand. Um, and basically um, what we, we've learned over the last couple of decades as um, technology has advanced and as oil has 
sold for higher prices is we've found that oil is oftentimes mixed in with minerals um, in making um, this substance called tar sand. And um, for decades, it wasn't technologically or financially feasible to extract the oil from the tar sands. Now that oil is so much sells for a much higher price, um, companies have more incentive to financially invest money in extracting this um, tar sand um, in these oil sands. And so we now have um, whole new reserves of oil to extract from because of this. Um, this. But, so, if the price of oil continues to climb, then we will probably see more research and in, um, investment in finding different sources of oil, and then it will become more financially feasible to extract that oil, and that extends when we reach sort of peak oil production. So, um, scientists are all very reluctant to just say when we're going to run out of oil. They've made those predictions in the past, and those predictions haven't come to to be true. Um, we do think that um, we have, out of all of our fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal, oil is the thing that we have the least of still um, based off of our current consumption levels. So let's talk a little bit about natural gas. Natural gas is um, used a little differently than oil. Um, the largest use of natural gas is to generate electricity at power plants. Um, about one third of all the natural gas that's sold in the United States and in Europe is used for electricity generation. We also use it residentially to heat our homes, we use it to cook, we use it to run dryers, furnaces, things like that. Um, we also can use it in cars. So compressed natural gas, or CNG as it's referred to, is a fuel that's developed from natural gas. Just like we can develop gasoline and jet fuel and diesel from oil, we can develop fuel from natural gas. And it actually burns a lot cleaner um, in automobiles than it does uh, than gas and diesel does. We don't have a lot of CNG engine cars in the United States or in North America or Europe as a whole. It's mostly seen in Pakistan, uh, Argentina, Brazil, India, China is mostly where we see um, compressed natural gas. So it's not a big factor in the United States. We also use natural gas as fertilizer in fertilizer. It's one of the raw materials that goes into fertilizer. So that's sort of um, what we're primarily using natural gases for. Sources of natural gas, where it comes from, um, it's often co-produced with oil, so it's usually found in similar reservoir spaces as, um, as oil. Oil is a liquid, gas is a gas, so it's usually sitting on top of oil. Um, so oftentimes when we're drilling oil, we are also drilling natural gas. Um, conventional, conventional natural gas is, you basically tap down into the the gaps in the spaces in the rocks where gas gets trapped and you extract it from there. Um, so these pockets underground. Um, but world natural gas supplies actually look much larger now than they did even a few decades ago um, because again of technological invention that has allowed producers to tap into shale rock. Um, and find the natural gas that's locked in the rocks as opposed to just being able to access gas that is trapped in the layers between rocks. So as a result, um, we now know that we have a lot of natural gas left in the earth. Um, so while we are seeing our oil supplies dwindle, um, much of our globe's natural gas reservoirs remain completely untapped still. The um, International Energy Agency, which is an international energy group conglomerate, um, estimates that we've really probably only used maybe 8% of all the natural gas that's available and recoverable. Um, several decades ago, geologists thought we were running out of natural gas. Um, but now, again, as technology has developed, we've discovered these new unconventional mechanisms for extracting natural gas from our Earth. Natural gas is also available pretty widely throughout the world. You can see in this figure here, other than Africa, um, you can find it in a lot of places. 
that makes it um, less um, of a political tool because um, we're not reliant on other countries and most countries aren't reliant on each other um, for their natural gas except for these countries like Africa and also um, there are concerns that um, sometimes Russia controls a large um, volume of all natural gas supplies um, and they can use that as a political bargaining tool uh, with Europe since U Europe has fewer natural gas supplies. But um, this new technology primarily is fracking and those of you who live in and around Kansas already know what um, are at least familiar with fracking because we hear about it in the news. Fracking technology is one of the main ways that we've been able to tap into um, uh, natural gas supplies that we never knew about before. Um, and it's what we have available to us to make it so that we probably have enough natural gas to power us for perhaps a couple centuries still. So fracking is a process in which we drill down into the earth um, and then we put a really high pressure water mixture down through what we just drilled and we direct it at the, ro the, the rock and the pressure then basically pushes the gas out of the rock because you're um, having to displace it when you put this high pressure water mixture. So you take water, sand, and various different chemicals and you inject that into the rock at a really high pressure and that then allows the gas to flow out um, to the head of the well is the process. Um, it can be carried out vertically but more commonly it's done horizontally. So you drill down and then you drill horizontally across the rock layer um, and create these pathways that allow the gas to be released. And the term fracking refers to the fact that we're fracturing apart rock at a really high pressure. Um, and as I've said, developing this technology has greatly expanded what we have available to us as far as natural gas is concerned. Um, and we have sufficient natural gas to meet energy needs for the foreseeable future. However, um, that does not mean that it is necessarily a sustainable fuel source. Natural gas, when burned, still produces carbon dioxide. Um, so it's not a question of if we're going to run out of natural gas, but it's a question of can we handle the pollution that we are creating when we burn natural gas. Um, there are also additionally environmental concerns with extracting natural gas through fracking. Um, it's in the news a lot about fracking and the effect it has on our environment. Some of the major concerns of environmentalists is that it's just not well tested yet. Um, and we don't know what the long-term environmental um, issues are going to be associated with fracking. Fracking requires this pumping of high pressure fluids into the earth and we're not necessarily sure of what effect those fluids and those chemicals are going to have, particularly if they leak into our fresh water supplies. And so there are scientists that argue um, we could be creating um, long term human health effects if these chemicals do get into our water supplies. Fracking also requires huge amounts of water inputs. Um, we have to pump in billions of gallons of water to fracture um, all of the wells that we have in the United States. We have to transport that water to the fracking site. We have to um, withdraw that water and so all of that has significant environmental costs as well. Um, and then there's also worries that the fracking process is increasing earthquakes. Um, there is growing um, evidence to show that there is a connection between fracking and earthquakes in central and eastern United States. We know this because it's in the news for Kansas and it's in the news for Oklahoma. There has been um, a dramatic increase in fracking um, in the United States since 2006 and you can see um, you can see in um, in this figure here um, th over time the number of earthquakes that have increased um, and it has in it we also know that there have been regions particularly um, north central Ka Oklahoma and southern Kansas that have a seen an increase in the number of earthquakes that they've experienced 
Um, there are still geologists out there and other scientists and experts that are arguing whether or not the two things are connected. Um, I think only time will be able to really sort that all out. Um, but we are now in a place where southern Kansas and central, um, north central Oklahoma have as many earthquakes as parts of California have. Um, so um, that is of a concern as well. What scientists do know is the earthquakes are not really a, a result of fracking itself. It's mostly um, actually the result of taking all of the fracking wastewater and injecting it back into the earth. So um, you have all of this water and solution that you're using to frack um, the, the shale to get the natural gas out. Well, that becomes wastewater. What do you do with it? Well, it's polluted wastewater. So you can't, um, you can't, um, in, in, you know, you can't dump it into rivers and streams. So scientists have been injecting the polluted wastewater back into the earth. Um, and that's what they believe is um, what is causing, um, causing the earthquakes. On the other hand, um, fracking is, has been responsible for a decrease in carbon emissions in the United States because um, the more natural gas we have, um, the more we can use natural gas instead of coal. And natural gas is burns tremendously cleaner than coal. So um, there's sort of two sides to the coin. Um, there's also the argument that says that fracking is really just distracting energy firms and governments from investing in renewable sources of energy, that we shouldn't be investing more money into non-renewable energy, and we should be um, instead of continuing our reliance on fossil fuels, be looking for renewable resources um, for, for our en meeting our energy needs. Okay, so oil versus natural gas. We've looked at where oil comes from, how we extract it. We've looked at natural gas and how we use it. Um, the, the bottom line is that um, coal, uh, or natural gas, excuse me, burns cleaner than oil. Um, and we haven't talked about coal yet, but it also burns much cleaner than coal. Natural gas is mostly made out of methane. Um, so it then, as a byproduct, produces significantly less CO2. However, methane is still a greenhouse gas. So it still contributes to global warming. Um, but remember, it has a lower um, global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So it's less dangerous of a greenhouse gas. Um, and then if you compare it to coal, it's just tremendously cleaner, um, less than a third of, um, sorry, less than half of the chemicals are, of carbon dioxide are released. Um, natural gas also has significantly less security concerns compared to oil because it's plentifully found around the world. So we're not reliant on like the Middle East, for example, as a primary source of our natural gas. We have an abundant amount of natural gas in the United States. Um, and so we're not having to, um, you know, it doesn't become a political tool in the same way that oil does. There are, though, still tremendous sustainability concerns with both oil and natural gas. Um, we are, when we use oil and when we use natural gas, we're reliant on a fossil fuel to meet our energy needs, and it's a fossil fuel, um, fossil fuels are not sustainable. We will, at some point in our civilization, use up our fossil fuels, um, and in the process, we're making enormous changes to our climate. So um, we um, need to move away from fossil fuels. Um, we need to find other ways to meet our global energy needs for our long-term sustainability. However, you know, like 80% of our world's energy needs are met through coal, oil, and natural gas. So it is a challenge and it's significant, um, particularly since our economies are so closely and tightly intertwined with all of this. Um, it becomes a very um, hot issue. Um, there's also, so we've kind of mostly focused on the environmental sort of aspects of this, but there's also huge social um, implications for oil and natural gas extraction. And we saw this um, come to the forefront recently with the um, conflict over the Dakota pipeline and um, the Dakota peoples, um, the Native Americans um, fighting to keep up 
um, oil pipeline from cutting through their sacred land um, because of the concerns that it would have over possible water pollution and um, disruption of their sacred space. So there's a lot of social sustainability issues um, surrounding the extraction and the transportation of these as well um, that we really can't overlook. Um, so that's, th th that's where I'm going to stop on this. As I said, our next lecture is going to focus on coal and it's also going to look at nuclear um, power. Um, the nuclear power information though I'm going to keep to a minimum because that's what our case study is focused on this week and our case study team should be um, primarily focusing on that for you guys.